What's up, dude? What's going on, Jay? How are you, Jack? Good, man. How you been, man? I've been busy. I've been busy. Um, which I guess in the line of uh, in the in the music world, that's uh, that's a good thing, right? It's a very <laughs> that's a very good thing. It's always better to be busy. Uh, but nothing can beat those days playing with playing to zero people. You know, like that's are always fun days. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. I don't know about that. <laughs> Dude, I remember I remember playing a show, literally. N- nobody was there but the bartenders. I was like doing dust angels on the bar floor. <laughs> and there's yeah, nobody um, like in the middle of a song, like guitar on and everything, just just down, just nobody's there. We we're just like, okay, well this is so I don't, interesting. I don't know what you mean. We played to the bartender <laughs> earlier this month. So <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh in all seriousness though, I mean that's uh that's I, I think that's kind of comes with the territory. You'll play uh in the same week, you can play in front of uh a couple thousand people or a couple hundred people and then turn around and the following day within 24 hours play to an almost empty room you know that's uh that's kind of part of yep. pain, cutting your teeth i guess yep all right man so let's dive in um why don't you go ahead and tell everybody about yourself uh where are you from first sure. and foremost yeah um so my name my name's audi mcginnis um and i play in the bluegrass band unspoken tradition like jay said and um i grew up in a small town in north carolina um, and, uh, by day, my, uh, my full-time job is actually, I'm a school teacher. So, uh, you know, I do that. And, uh, the band has kind of always been a weekend warrior thing until just recently. It's, uh, it's really kind of, uh, taken off. And, uh, you know, now, now several of the guys in the band, we're, we're trying to like kind of balance the whole, the whole, uh, full-time versus, uh, versus the music life. Thing, you know so it's, a, it's tough man uh, it is <laughs> it's tough for any any anything which is something i definitely want to dive into more is like how much that side hustle which is your music gig like how do you balance those two and actually uh you know w- when do you decide to make that full time but before we get into that why don't you uh tell everybody how you got into bluegrass music and, and what's kept you into it for this long <laughs> okay so um it's kind of funny like um really my dad my dad was a huge bluegrass fan still is um and and he's probably more than anybody my dad is responsible for uh my my interest in music my love of music uh he definitely both my parents really but my dad especially um garnered a a a love for music in me very early on um and so when I was about 12 years old, I got a guitar for uh, a Christmas gift. And um, a couple years later, um, he uh, he had, you know, like bluegrass had always been in the home. Um, we listened to a lot of everything and just, you know, all, all over the place. But bluegrass was a, it was a common, you know, the common denominator all mm-hmm. the time. Um, and really more like progressive, progressive bluegrass stuff. I mean, you know, like if I went over to my grandparents' house, I would hear the traditional stuff like Bill Monroe and Ralph Stanley and things like that. But my dad was into the more progressive stuff at the time. Um, but uh, after he realized that I was going to take guitar seriously, he said, man, I'll get you a really nice acoustic guitar if you promise to learn to play bluegrass music, you know. And uh, I kind of just did it for the guitar at first. But then after <laughs> learning, after really like getting into it and 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 realizing the the complexity and and some of the nuances that are involved in the music and also how deeply tied to culture it is in this area. Um, I knew it was something that I, you know, I, I basically, I fell in love with it even more than I, than I ever realized I would. And so maybe that was dad's plan all along. I think maybe he tricked me. He kind of lured me with the guitar. Well, no, well, no, well you no, played no, with no, your no, brother, no. right? Trap. <laughs> Say that again. I'm sorry. You play with your brother, right? Yeah, yeah. Zane, uh, Zane is in the group as well, and uh, he actually um, he plays banjo, and uh, it was kind of a similar scenario for him. <laughs> no, uh, I think that was your dad's plan, man. He's like, we're just gonna cultivate yeah, he, my he own bluegrass a, band. He built a family band. He built yeah. a family band, except he uh, he never joined it. So. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like the Jackson Five, man. Except it's it's the McGinnis brothers. <laughs> the McGinnis Two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, man. Well, uh, so what kind of, what kind of music did you get inspired by when you were, when you were first learning and, and getting better at the craft? Well, I mean, I guess like originally as a guitar player in general, just outside of bluegrass. Um, I mean, I grew up listening to your general, like nineties rock, you know, alternative stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and I still, you know, I still go back to that stuff quite a bit um, from from my childhood, you know, like the, the early to mid 90s kind of stuff. But um, in the bluegrass world, just to throw out a few, I mean, Tony Rice was a huge, huge, huge influence on me. Um, you know, he was doing stuff on the guitar in the 70s, even like some of the stuff like his Manzanita album and Native American and cold on the shoulder those were actually out and circulating before i was born and by the time i was old enough to listen to it even today um it is so far ahead of mm -hmm. a whole lot of other stuff that's out there even even today but especially back then you know um so rice was a very heavy influence um guys like sam bush uh peter rowan um in fact one of the and I'll save this for a little later on, maybe. But uh, there was a band called Olden in the Way that we, we listened to quite a bit. And actually, Jerry Garcia was a member of that band. And it was a bluegrass, uh, a bluegrass, uh, you know, setup. But uh, Jerry was in that group. And, you know, like when I said, Dad, listen to some of the more progressive stuff. That's a good example of it. And I think that was how he kind of bridged the gap for me between, you know, a lot of other types of music and bluegrass with some of those guys that weren't as traditional you know hmm. yeah tony tony rice man one heck of a guitar player dude he can <laughs> pick the freak. heck out of a guitar a as a matter of fact before uh before i logged on um here to to, to speak with you tonight i was actually <laughs> sitting tonight even uh trying to learn <laughs> trying to pick out some of his stuff uh even with tabs and and videos and stuff and and <laughs> I still can't do it. <laughs> the man is, he's, he's unreal. He's That's unreal. tough. Hey guys, if you haven't, if, if you're watching this and you haven't checked out Tony Rice, I, I recommend go giving him a listen. Cause especially if, if you're into guitar music or your guitar player, it's crazy. Yeah, he, And outside of bluegrass, even he's an excellent jazz musician. Um, mm -hmm. The man is just super well versed on the guitar. So absolutely. Absolutely. And, and also a lot of people don't realize uh, Garcia was a huge um, bluegrass player growing up. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's a, a lot of people don't don't realize that if, if you're not like a huge Dead fan. But um, all right, well, let's move on. So w what was the bluegrass scene uh, like when you first started and has it changed much since you guys started? Oh, it's it's definitely changed. Um uh, and, and, you know, it's it's interesting to me, like, what I'm finding out about the scene as a bigger picture when I was young is maybe a little different than the way I remember it just because of where I grew up. Um, but, you know, I can tell you this. Um, there, I can remember going to a festival in Wilkesboro, North Carolina called Merle Fest that is now considered, like probably one of the top five largest and most popular and most well-known um, folk Americana and bluegrass festivals in the United States. And I remember going there when I was probably six years old or so. And it's one of my earliest memories of live music. And I can remember seeing some of the greatest uh, folk and bluegrass performers of that era performing there on a flatbed truck, like the back, it was just a flatbed trailer at that point. And they had like hay bales everywhere. And now if you've ever been to Merle Fest or seen what Merle Fest has turned into, it's unreal. I mean, I can't even begin to even, even like estimate how many people walk through those gates every year. It's huge. Um, so to say, 
to say that it has grown since I was a kid um, is an understatement. Um, but I would also say it's it's actually like a huge relief because I remember when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, I remember kind of being under the impression that bluegrass was something that was kind of starting to die away or fall out of popularity. Um, and it seems like in the last five, seven years, there has been uh, quite a grassroots revival of, of, of uh, a lot of the uh, folk and Americana and grassroots music. Mm. And being a part of it is great. But even if I didn't play and I was just, uh, you know, someone who enjoyed it, it's really refreshing to see that because like I said earlier, I feel like, I feel like bluegrass in particular is very tied to uh, our roots, especially here in the Appalachian mountain region. And, uh, and you know, it's something that's important to keep around. Uh, you, you can't just throw that stuff out and deny it. So, so yeah, but uh, I guess in, in short, in a nutshell, I feel like uh, things have just kind of exploded lately uh, as far as the music scene goes. Agreed. So what do you think about um, more progressive bluegrass like the Punch Brothers that are that have been um, blowing up? Uh, the Punch Brothers are incredible. Um, yes, in are. fact, I uh, I just bought tickets about three days ago to go see them uh, in a couple weeks. Yeah. So, uh, so if that tells you anything about how I feel about the Punch Brothers. But, um, but no, uh, the progressive guys, man, I mean – you got to give them props. You got to give them props. It's, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of people that are very down the middle and, and kind of purist, if you will, in within the bluegrass genre. Um, and I think a lot of people don't give the progressive guys enough love. Mm. Um, but it's really funny because the opportunities that I've had to talk to um, progressive musicians, um, when it ever comes up, they all worship and just i mean just look up to those traditional players so they, they think so highly of the guys that really paved the way and i just think it's it's kind of ironic that the progressive musicians look to the the traditional guys and just think you know practically idolize them in some cases and then a lot of people that are fans of the very traditional music don't really appreciate in my opinion sometimes don't give the uh, the progressive guys enough love. Um, it's the future of bluegrass, whether, uh, I, I don't want to say whether you like it or not, because I mean, anybody can choose not to like it at any time, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of like that evolve or die kind of thing. In my opinion, you, uh, things are going to change over time. <laughs> yeah. You know? I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely seeing the, in terms of bluegrass, the progression is is inevitable, really. Yeah. But the one thing I like about like artists like the Punch Brothers, whatever they they, it's it's still at its core, hardcore bluegrass. But it, it's just there's so much talent and skill in other genres of music that they can intertwine with traditional bluegrass music. It's it's fascinating Absolutely. to see. Th- and, and we're not just seeing that in, in bluegrass. It, it's many other styles of music. I mean, it just, I mean, look at look at the weird progression of of pop country music, right? Like, it, it was <laughs> country music at its core, I think, and then it's just bringing in pop elements to make it more consumable, right? So I suppose just... I, su- I suppose that's uh, <laughs> maybe I have a stronger opinion about pop country than I do progressive uh, bluegrass. Yeah. But but no, you're right. I mean, it's you can't expect you can't expect any genre to continue to just pump out the. I mean, you know, like there are only so many chords and so many notes and so many sequences that are appealing and and satisfying to the human brain and 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 uh, you know in a way as limitless as music can be, there is still a framework that has to be there. And I mm-hmm. think if you, if then you can't just say, this is a rock song and play that rock song and 25,000 variations. Um, but it's essentially still the same stuff, you know, and it, it it's not evolving. People are going to get bored with that. Yeah, um, you know, sure. and, and again, that's not knocking the original stuff. I mean, that's the template or the, the mold from which everything else is pressed, but, um, you know, but it, it can't just stay that way forever. It's got to evolve. And you're right. Like, it's not just, 
it's not just bluegrass. It's it's any kind of music that's been on planet Earth for longer than you know a couple decades. It has to change. Yeah. It has to change. That's that's the one constant is change, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. So <laughs> so moving on. Tell me about your day job, you, Mr. Uh, Mr. McGinnis. I guess that's what the students call you. Oh, man. Well, so it's summertime right now, and uh, that affords me the opportunity to play a lot of music because I'm a school teacher by day. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, uh, I teach high school English, and uh, I love my job. I mean, I really do. I'm passionate about education. Um, I really uh, got into it because I like working with with kids and, and, and young people and watching them grow and learn and, and everything like that. I, I really am passionate about it. Um, and uh, it's great for me that I have a job that I care about so much that I can also, it gives me like a consistent schedule where I know I have weekends and I know that I have a summer off too. So in a way it's kind of a double, um, uh, I don't know. I, like it's 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 doubly uh, advantageous to me um, with my music because I can I can teach and and do these things and it's like I can turn it on and turn it off and on the weekends I can go play music and in the summer we can organize some small tours and things like that and really go much harder for two or three months out of the year. You know. Yeah, that's um, not, so not, not a lot of jobs will be able to do that. Yeah, well, and that's, you know, and that's the thing, like, not all the guys in the band are teachers, and I think the ones that aren't are sort of jealous of those of us that can, in the summertime, we're like, let's let's go gig, let's go tour, let's get in the van, let's go, you know, and, and it's not always, it doesn't always work uh, as, as effortlessly for everybody in the band, you know, so... Yeah. Uh, you know, my my day job is my day job, and it'll probably always be my day job unless something huge happens. Um, but, you know, it's it's nice for me that I have a job that <sighs> no two days are the same. You know, it's not an office job. It's not a cubicle job. It's 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 not menial uh, labor. You know, no two days are the same. And it's been like that for 11 years now. So um, that's great. And then it also affords me uh, the structure that I know that I can go and plan, you know, shows for my, my, uh, dual other life, you know, <laughs> um, even six months, eight months, a year in advance. And I know I'm going to have those days off or the summer off or whatever. So it's great. It's, I really get to have the best of both worlds. And unlike most musicians, I have uh, retirement plan and health insurance, <laughs> I won't say much, but, but quite a few, you know, I, I know quite a few that end up in a pickle because, they don't have that stuff. You know? That's, that's so. very true. So, so what got you in the education to begin with? Um, well, I went to um, Appalachian State, and um, you know that's a huge. There's a huge education school there, and um, just a lot of my friends up at App were 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 training to be teachers, studying to be teachers. Um, I've got a couple of teachers in my family. There were a couple of teachers growing up, going through middle school and high school that I really thought a lot of that I thought really helped shape me as a person and uh, some coaches along the way, you know, and, and things like that. So uh, I just kind of, uh, I don't know, teachers are uh, a big factor, I think, in a lot of people's lives, whether they realize it or not. And I don't think, I don't think teachers necessarily get enough credit. Absolutely. Um, that's not, that's not just me tooting my own horn because I'm a teacher. I mean, really and truly uh, teachers, teachers really do do so much to shape you know, society. Um, and uh, a, a good teacher can can impact you for years, just like a bad teacher can, you know, so I, I wanted to uh, have the, you know, get into it so I could be hopefully for even if it were just a handful of kids, you know, uh, over over my whole career, just to be that uh, that person that they uh, could say, you know, he really, he really made a difference for me or whatever. So yeah. That's awesome. So is is that app state the same one that beat Michigan with that field goal? Yes, it <laughs> just, is. Just, yes, it is. Just, I will never forget the day. <laughs> will never forget the day. Um, <laughs> this Labor Day weekend. I know that much. Yeah. So so you already kind of talked about this, but how do you actually like how's balancing your side hustle, your music career with the full full time job of being a, a 
because it is a full time job being a teacher coming from, you know, me and my wife both taught and I worked in American school system a little bit. So, I mean, but teachers like that's a that's not it's not just a nine to five job. Right. I mean, you're there early, whether you're shuffling kids in or whatever, and then staying late and doing paperwork and grading papers and all that stuff. So how do you balance yeah. those two? Well, so, I mean, it's <laughs> it's tough. And to say that I never bring work home would, would be a lie. I mean, I, I do my fair share of grading and essay reading, and especially as an English teacher, you know, it's, it's not just like multiple choice problems. Like a lot of stuff's open-ended and anything that I assign them, if I haven't read it beforehand, I need to read it before, you know, before they come back to me or, or even before I assign it in most cases. So it's, uh, you know, like the, the work does not only happen in the classroom, um, even though those are the 40 hours I get paid for those, you know, the, there, there are some other hours outside, but um, luckily for me, um, technology does a lot. Not, I won't get into the programs that we use or anything else like that, you know, but, but, um, but technology goes a long way in kind of streamlining that process. Um, making things a little bit easier, as well as giving the kids an, uh, an opportunity to have an alternative way to uh, give me feedback, you know, and, and sometimes it might be like, instead of, instead of writing this out, send me a video that explains it, it might just be them talking, you know, and I, you know, uh, I understand this, this, and this, or, or this is what I think about that. And so little things like that, that I can do to make sure that they're understanding what's, what's being given to them, um, that kind of streamline the process. So it's not always just hours of grading things like that. Um, and I'm not going to lie, there are plenty of nights, um, even during the school year, through the week, that we might play a show that might be two or three hours away from, from home. And I get home at like 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning and wake up at 5.36 to wake up and roll into school and do it all again. Um, you know, and that doesn't mean I, I show up without lesson plans or anything else. It's just I have to stay on top of my schedule. If I know that I have a, a, a gig on a school night, my plans are lined up and ready to go before I ever walk out the door on the day before. So that way, when I walk in, all I have to do is execute, you know. So it's more than anything, it's about me staying on top of my schedule, staying on top of my planning, you know, and, and, and I never... I would never do these things to the detriment of my students. You know, it's like, well, McGinnis has a gig tomorrow, so we're not going to do anything. He's going to show a movie like that never happens. Um, so it's, it's always me just having to make sure that I'm very, uh, very meticulous with my planning and execution, you know, and not only just with my job. I mean, it's the same thing at home with family and, you know, making sure that I make time for my wife and, and my daughter and, 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 everybody else too, you know, so it's just, uh, you, you keep a little book and you make sure that you hold your appointment, so to speak. <laughs> so what would it take to get you full time in music to leave the teaching career behind? <laughs> um, you know, I really, I really don't know. Um, that's a tough question because is it a money issue? Um, well, I mean, at the end of the day, of course, money, I'm not going to say money doesn't matter. You know, um, I would not want to necessarily, um, I would not necessarily want to make the jump into a full-time musician position unless I knew that I could support my family. And that Absolutely. doesn't necessarily mean that I would do it, you know, um, without making some changes or adjustments, you know, that might be reasonable, but I don't, I don't want to be a starving artist, you know, in, in that regard. So it's hard to say, man, I, I think, and, and, and part of the reason I think it's hard to say is, is because, and this was something that, that we were discussing, um, you know, earlier that, um, I wonder how many times, you know, you see it in movies about music, uh, like, like, uh, these sort of like docudramas and, and things like that, that are, um, it's like this band played one show and the next day they're, they're flying on a jet and they've made it. Like that's not how it happens, you know? And, and it just makes me wonder if I'll ever know when that moment is, you know, like when, when do I, when do I pull the trigger on that? When do I make the call? Because you don't make it overnight. It's an incremental small step kind of thing. And it just makes me wonder 
um, if if I'll ever if I if when the opportunity to to make the move happens, will I even see it? You know, um, I don't know. It's it's tough, man. Um, you know, I think the band we've done so much over the last five six years, especially. Um, but we uh, we've still got a long way to go. You know, um, I mean, just this past year we we signed with a record label. We've we've put out three albums, but this this is the first one with a record label, like a legit, real, top of the line record label. And yeah. and the people the people there are incredible, and they've done so much for us. Um, so it's like I still see all this growth and and just you know all this success that I feel like I'm so proud of what we've done, but I also feel like I can't see the top of the mountain yet. You know, so I don't know if I have an answer for you on that. It's tough. Yeah, it's a, it's, I would say more than likely when you know that, that, I mean, if you could support your family, then I'm, I'm sure that would be the, the next logical step, right? Is, yeah, is financial. Yeah. I mean, and, then, and I guess like for me at the same time, cause I mean, I know, I know guys that, that do it, you know, and support their family and seem to support their family pretty well, you know, making, making music in the bluegrass world. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, at that point, it almost comes into the weighing how much am I going to be home to, you know, and I'm not afraid to get in the, in the van and ride to go play. Um, in fact, I love doing it, but every mile you're on the road, every, every night that you're in a hotel room or, you know, whatever, um, you're, you're not at home. And, and that's part, you know, it's, it's like you got to leave the castle to build the castle kind of thing. And, and it's tough sometimes. So, you know, there's always going to be a, a balancing act, whether it's between your, your side hustle and your full-time job or family and what your side hustle used to be is now your full-time job. It's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's tough. So, but yeah. And, and what kind of person would I be anyway, if when you asked me that question, I was like, well, I would need this and this and this. <laughs> It sounded like I was making some kind of uh, demands or something. I don't know. But, yeah. Or just really organized. Man, well, maybe. I don't know. It's like, like yeah. yeah right, like these I are the things that I need before I can quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, man, I'm, I'm all about just like, for me anyway, like, this is something I'm passionate about. As passionate as I am about teaching, I'm equally as passionate, if not maybe a little more passionate about making music and and experiencing those things and getting to see the country and even the world doing it. And, uh, you know, th those things are very important to me too. Um, but I'm also, I'm the kind of person that I like to just kind of keep my head down and keep working hard too, you know? So um, it's, I don't know, sometimes I don't stop and weigh these decisions out as often as maybe, maybe some people or maybe as often as even I should, but, you know, I think, I think we're all, even the other guys in the band, I think we're all just kind of still content with just grinding it out right now and making it as, you know, just, just, just getting it done. So. Speaking of which, I don't think we've even touched on this. Tell us about the group. What's the name? How did you guys start? Okay. So, um, name of the group is Unspoken Tradition. Um, we started, uh, after I came home from college, there were a couple of us that, you know, we, we came back home and didn't have day jobs quite yet and uh, just got together and started picking. And there were there was another guy that I went to high school, two other guys that I went to high school with, actually, and uh, got together with them. And at the time, we didn't even really have any real plans to make it a bluegrass band. It just kind of organically turned into that. Like when we first started getting together and jamming, it was not bluegrass. It was all over the place. It was like a variety thing, you know, mm. just every, every song was different, but then it eventually kind of coalesced. We started moving in a direction, you know, and, and, um, realized that we were going to be a bluegrass band. And so then we picked my brother up cause he played banjo and, uh, unspoken tradition was born. Um, at first we were just four guys. We've had a couple of staff changes here and there, um, along the way, but, uh, and we've just been, I mean, I guess the band as, as an actual entity has existed going on 11 years, I think. Yeah, so it's been, it's uh, been a while. Yeah, it's shocking um, considering like we literally just 
spent years in, in my mom and dad's basement. I know that's like the most stereotypical band thing that you could ever hear said out loud. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been, it's been a long road, man. And, uh, we're, you know, we went from playing little bar gigs, which, you know, those are great. It's a good way to cut your teeth and get your live show down and learn the do's and don'ts and the, all that stuff. But, uh, you know, I mean, we, we've had the opportunity to play some absolute bucket list opportunity of a lifetime shows along the way. And like I said, like signing, signing with mountain home has just been a dream come true and cutting records with them. And, and some of the people I've gotten to meet along the way and the boys are just, you know, all the guys in the band feel the same way. Um, we all just love the music and, and love, love just, just doing it, man. It's great. So <laughs> That's awesome. So what do you think are the pros and cons of being in a, in a genre like bluegrass with where the market isn't as big as say like rock or hip hop or whatever? Well, the cons are that the, the market isn't as big. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I'm kidding about that. Uh, in a sense, um, what I would say, actually, let me, let me start with that. So, you know, like we're on Spotify and, and, and we use all the streaming and stuff because I mean, whether, whether you like it or not, it's, that's the future of music, you know, um, or at least access to music. And, um, so, you know, it's, it's funny to me how I can track our music and our data on there and watch how many people are, you know, accessing our content on these, on these streaming sites. And <laughs> I, uh, and then I get on and like look at a band like uh, something that's mainstream rock, and I'm like, oh, you know, like I, I'm like, oh man, we're doing really well. Like this song has X amount of plays or whatever. And then I get on and I find somebody that's you know like a like a really like mainstream band, and I'm like, uh, never mind, you know. So the uh, the market the market it it is. It's uh, even though we were talking earlier about how I do feel like it's a burgeoning a burgeoning uh, population that like everybody's getting more interested in this roots movement and everything. It's still a small slice of the big pie, you know? Um, and, and I see that as a con, but I also see it as a pro. Like it, it's kind of a double-edged sword because when you, when you learn how to appeal to those people, um, I feel like we have some very loyal fans, some very dedicated people. Um, so, for me, the fact that the slice of the pie is small does not necessarily matter so much because I feel like the fans are some of the best people in the world. You know, like just just getting to getting music out there to them. And when you hear those people come up and just say, man, this song changed my life or I really love this song or my kid loves this song. You know, so the bluegrass genre, I would say people are like the, the, the people that are into it are just really entrenched in it. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the big things for me. Um, the other pro I would say is that I don't have to haul around too much gear. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, no pedal boards or big amplifiers or anything like that. It's a, uh, it's a pretty simple setup. You, you, you know, Adi, I was thinking uh, about that actually on my way home from picking the kid up today. I was like, I was like, I wonder if he's heard of this whole storm in area 51 thing. Cause I was like, <laughs> for for a group if you want to like get some <laughs> notoriety out there just uh you don't need any electric stuff but you just take your take your instruments out and park outside uh area 51 and <laughs> try not to get shot and keep everybody happy well the problem the problem will be everybody will hear us on the way in but nobody will come out to come back and like download our music so <laughs> So then there's there. nobody up in the middle. <laughs> they, they didn't they didn't mow down everybody so well that was a bus guys <laughs> this is this is the most ridiculous thing i've seen since tide pods but <laughs> it's, it's been entertaining it's been entertaining to say the least since so, tide pods yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I forgot about the tide pod thing until you brought it up thanks Audie. now i'm going to be questioning <laughs> uh humanity again tonight <laughs> uh <laughs> Tide pods. Okay. Anyway, uh, so let's get into some uh, geeky stuff. I always I like to do this with the uh, musician guests. So, what gear do you use? What's your favorite? Give me the rundown. Sure. Oh man, like I'm within the world of bluegrass. Like I just said, it's just, it's a pretty simple rig. But man, like I'm kind of a gear nerd too. Um, so I uh, 
first of all, let me say, just in case anybody else that plays acoustic guitar is out there, I'm about to throw out a bunch of a bunch of names of some stuff here, like some some products. But um, first of all, let me say I, I don't have any like sponsorships or any of that stuff. So everything I'm saying here is purely me as a paying customer, you know, uh, all that stuff. Um, so I really stand behind these products for real. Um, Diderio guitar strings, um, in particular, I have played EJ17 uh, Diderio acoustic strings, medium gauge, they're phosphor bronze. I think it's 80-20 blend. Um, seriously, out of the almost 20 years, 22 years that I've been playing guitar, I'll bet 20 of those I have played EJ17s almost exclusively. Every now and then I'll go back to a pack and say, I'm going to try these or I'm going to try to always come back, always come back. They're the best, absolutely the best for me, for the type of music I play for, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, uh, you can't beat them. You can't beat them. Um, awesome. I, uh, I use shove capos. They're great. Um, you can buy capos that do the exact same job just as well for about five times as much. Shove's great. It's a good, solid, simple tool. Um, I just bought, um, so just recently I went, I, I, I do, uh, I have modernized myself enough now that I, I do have a pickup in my acoustic guitar. Ooh. Um, so yeah, that's been a, that's been a big transition for us as a band. I was the first one to kind of make the jump. Um, and I was really kind of concerned. I did a lot of studying and a lot of searching about it. Um, because I mean, without the proper stuff, I don't know. Um, to me, uh, 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 an acoustic guitar with a pickup just does not sound quite as natural. Um, so I've actually um, invested some money in LR bags. Um, they've got a, a pickup system that you put in the guitar. Um, it's called the Lyric and it's, a, it's actually a, a tiny microphone that goes in um, right under the bridge and it sounds so natural um hmm. actually if you listen to uh sturgill simpson at all or if any of you are familiar with him i'm pretty sure his last two albums any acoustic guitar you're hearing on there was not mic'd in the studio it was actually played through this exact same system it's super super natural sounding um i run that through the lr bags venue uh di it's got a tuner and you know uh, a boost button and uh an EQ and a bunch of other little goodies on there. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, it sounds about as real as playing through a microphone, which in my genre of music, having a guitar that doesn't sound, you want your guitar to sound as natural as possible, you know? Um, so that, that gets it done. It really does. Um, I use uh, blue chip picks. I don't know if you're familiar with those. You're a, you're a guitar player. So, I don't know why I've got this laying here on the table, so I thought I'd show it to you. Mm -hmm. um, nice. This guy actually makes these out of some kind of material that I think this stuff is actually made to go in uh, superconductors. So in bluegrass, it's uh, like a big thing, man. Like everybody wants to play with tortoise shell picks. And the problem with that is you can't really just harvest tortoise shell anymore. It's illegal. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, these picks are the only picks that I've ever found that have the tone that a tortoise shell pick has and they absolutely do not wear out I've had this for like 10 years played it hard played it often and yeah um, and my crown and glory is uh, I just purchased a new guitar man Ooh. it's uh, and it's it's pretty sweet it's a uh, pre-war it's called pre-war that's the name of the company um, and they torify all the wood so it's like chemically, the way I understand it, it's like chemically aged. The idea behind this is your brand new guitar sounds like a 100 year old guitar, um, which again, with acoustic instruments and vintage instruments, that's that's a big thing tone wise. Um, and someone said, let's see the new guitar. Say what? Someone said, let's see the new guitar. Really? Yeah. Uh, I'll have to leave the frame. Go ahead, man. I'll be right back. I will <laughs> I will I will go get the baby real quick. All right, guys.
So I, I really appreciate the questions, everybody. Keep them coming. Uh, we're going to get to them pretty soon. Uh, I think we'll probably have 20 minutes left. But, uh, yeah, go ahead and send in as many questions as you want, and we'll try to wrap them up uh, towards the end. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see the guitar. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast in the future, he actually went to go get his new guitar to show everybody, but I might cut this out of the, the, pod, the podcast. I don't, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I will ask if he can play Taylor Swift. <laughs> I'm back. Um, can can you play to, Taylor um, Swift? I, um, <laughs> uh, just let me show you the guitar. Okay. Um, so, uh, Wait, does that uh, mean yes. you can play Taylor Swift? Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to plead the fifth, no comment on that. <laughs> but, uh, so the first thing I want to point out about this guitar is so this company, they model their instruments. All of these are modeled after 30s and 40s model Martins and Gibson acoustic guitars. Um, so uh, what you're looking at here is actually a pretty close replica of what I believe is like maybe a 36 Martin D18. Um, and if I hold it up, I'm going to try to show you here. They even like distress the guitar to make it look and feel kind of played in oh, there's wow. some like on the back there's even like some buckle rash i don't know if you can see that i know it's in the white and there's a weird reflection i'm sorry but um but yeah man this thing is and it's like feather light it's it's probably i wouldn't be surprised if it weighs less than four pounds it, it and it's so loud and resonant and just oh i love this thing so much so much it's an absolute banjo killer um for those of you who know or have ever been to a bluegrass jam or maybe even some people are you know that are that are watching this might play um but uh they uh it's always tough to compete with the banjo and this guitar has no problem with that at all um so, yeah this is this is it man this is this is probably as far as i'm concerned the last guitar i'll ever buy um don't let my wife hear that uh but yeah so that's it <laughs> she'll hold it to that one yeah keep that one on the down low uh yeah. cool man well thanks for bringing that out dude uh anything else you want to mention before we move on uh gear wise not really um i mean we uh you know i, I like i said everything everything that i just brought up i know i just did a lot of name dropping and and, and company naming and things like that but um I feel like it was a fair a fair thing to do since since we were talking about gear. But um, like I said, I don't I don't have any sponsorships or anything like that. Like everything that I'm everything that I'm talking about here, it's stuff that I I play on the road. I play it hard. I, you know, like a lot of I'm I'm not I'm not necessarily the most delicate and uh, easy handed on my gear. So the stuff that I use, it's it's good quality, like tough stuff. You know, um, very dependable very dependable stuff so i put i put my i put my dollar on it you know awesome all right well let's move on to the last few and then we'll get to q a so what is your sure. advice for people starting in music performance um like my advice uh that's tough i mean i guess one of my biggest things would be every show you play once you get that first gig, you have to treat every single show like it is the biggest thing you've ever done. Um, you, I can't tell you, and, I, and I'm almost speaking more from like, once I started playing and gigging and, and I, I was spending time on stage, I started to notice more and more what people were doing when I was in the crowd as a musician standing in the crowd and I was watching other, other musicians on stage, you know, um, people really watch your reactions to things. People really watch your facial expressions to things. Um, when something goes wrong on stage, you've got to just play it off, play through it. Um, because 90% of the people in the crowd didn't hear it. And the other 10% understand, you know, um, your live performance is more of a cumulative thing. They're not analyzing every little note or every missed chord or every false start. It's about the experience. So don't let little things like that catch you up. Um, always have a smile on your face. 
don't wear shorts and flip flops on stage if you're a bluegrass player. <laughs> um, unspoken tradition in all in all seriousness. It took us a couple of years to learn how to dress. <laughs> um, but you know, it's just about being professional and putting your best foot forward, putting a smile on your face, getting out there and you know, if you don't look like you're having fun doing it, nobody's gonna believe you're having fun doing it. And nobody's gonna want to hear your music or go to your shows. So that's my biggest piece of advice. And the other small thing that we talked about earlier, like I said, I, I don't think it can be I don't think it can be said enough the importance, at least in my opinion, of just keeping your head down and putting in the work because you love doing it. You know, um, this is not like you see on TV where somebody sings into the can and the next day they're sitting in a mansion and that's not how it works. Um, and and I, would, I would dare say it's not like that in any genre, maybe the top 2% of all you know, musicians, that might be the case, but the other 98% of us, you, you get there by grinding, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's the biggest piece of advice I could give you. I think. Yeah. I don't think, and this is, a, this is for content creators, musicians, artists, whatever. Uh, a lot of the people that you guys find, um, like through Spotify or you're finding them on the web or whatever. And you're like, Oh, I just discovered them. They must be new. Most of these people have been around four plus years have been doing it. It was a long road to get to that Spotify click. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But to you, but to you guys, you think, Oh, they're a new artist. They're a new group. Um, mm -hmm. More than likely, no, they're not. They've been around and put in the, put in the, the legwork. Yeah, man. It's not, I mean, create being, a, being a content creator in any, in any realm, I would imagine it's not for the faint of heart. There's a lot of there's a lot of hard work. You pour your heart and, and soul into everything you do. I mean, you know, like when we when we write our albums, we write our songs, we we do our performances. We don't go into that stuff half hearted. Every every single every single song, every single you know, every single album, everything. It's always you got to put your best foot forward, and and it's it's really not for the faint of heart. There are lots of disappointments along the way, um, and you just got to keep your head head down but also your chin up if you know what i mean be tough and uh and just do it because you love it and if you don't love it don't do it that's you know that, it's that simple find something you love and and do it so yep. um all right man so what are what's the future plans for yourself and for unspoken tradition i mean what's coming like I up said earlier, i don't necessarily have a 10-year plan drawn out or anything but i mean i obviously i've i've been teaching long enough at this point that I, I mean, I, I'm going to keep teaching. I'm going to keep doing what I do. And, and ultimately, I'd like to see Unspoken Tradition put out a couple more albums. Uh, if it ever got to the point where we were able to do this thing full time, I would I would do my best to recognize when that time was and, and, and know when it was time to pull the trigger. Um, I'd like to see the group do a little more traveling and, uh, you know, uh, figure out a way to to get the most out of that music career and also all of us be able to maintain our livelihoods and our family lives that's that's the big thing you know and for us like i don't know if it's like this in every band um but we get along really great i feel like i feel like those guys are my brothers i mean and not just my actual brother but the other guys too um they're 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 family and so you know it's uh i think as long as we're as long as we're making music together and we're all happy, the future will work itself out. <laughs> Agreed. All right, so uh, let's get to the Q and A section. Uh, so I've got one here. It says, "How do you describe bluegrass to someone who is not familiar with it?" Um. <laughs> uh. We're going off script now. I don't know. Uh, so I would say, first of all, let me say this as, as a disclaimer. My definition of bluegrass means nothing. Apparently, I mean, you know, like anymore. And, and that's that's just the reality of it. Because as we were talking before, as things have evolved, um, what I consider bluegrass and what my neighbor considers bluegrass might be two very different things. But I will tell you what I think. So I think that you have to have a particular um a particular group of instruments being an upright bass a fiddle which is the same thing as a violin um well sort of uh, a violin has strings and a fiddle has strings um that was a joke 
and uh, <laughs> you got a you got a guitar, an acoustic guitar, uh, a banjo, a five string banjo, and uh, a mandolin. So uh, that I really think that having that instrument composition gets you most of the way there. Um, I think that you've got to play most of your stuff in four four time. I think it's got to have a big uh, one and three beats so bump 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 like that. Um, it mostly stays within the one, four, five. So we're talking GCD or CFG or, you know, uh, like that. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do too vocally. It, you you got to have three part harmonies, uh, things like that. Um, and, and really I, I'm, the more I talk about this, the more I feel like I'm kind of failing at the definition. And I think it's because <laughs> bluegrass is also not just a, it's not, and I'm, I'm going to get poetic here, but it's, it's also a, um, kind of a state of mind, you know, it's a sense of place. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's about, it, it's about heritage. It's about the past. It's about appreciating um, where you came from and things like that. Like a lot of the early guys were writing things about, you know, the, the cabin that they grew up in and how they've gone home and it's not there anymore. It's dilapidated and mom and dad have gone on and things like that. So it's got like a lonely side. It's got that yearning to it um, as long as far as like the, the lyrics go. So, yeah, um, that's that's kind of my definition. Hmm, good answer. Um, what do your uh, students think of your uh, music? Oh, man. So, uh Mm, it's it's interesting it kind of i i uh i try to control how much of that information i let out um but it's out it, there now man <laughs> it, 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 i know right yeah um but uh it gets to the point so like every school i've worked at three different schools over the course of my 11 years like just every couple of years i i need a change of scenery, even if I'm not changing professions, you know, I, I like to, I like to go, you know, just kind of look at new horizons sometimes. So, um, I, uh, when I get to a school, I kind of, uh, I'm, I'm apprehensive about just, I'm not like, I am in a band, you know, um, <laughs> but eventually slowly people kind of figure it out. Like some of my coworkers will start adding me on Facebook and I'm posting stuff you know, write-ups in, in bluegrass magazines or like our latest uh, single release and things like that. And I'll add them as a friend. They're like, well, I didn't know you were in a band. Like, yeah, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so, but over the course of a couple of years, the kids always find out. And whether the kids, some kids think it's like really cool and some kids have like no interest in it whatsoever. And I certainly don't like, we don't just talk about Mr. McGinnis being in a band, all the, you know, like whatever. But what I will say is I think, it's kind of cool to, even if the kids don't appreciate the music itself, I think it's important for them to see me as a human being and as a teacher, like have this job, but also have this other thing that I'm like really passionate about that I care about, you know? And, and cause I think I remember when I was a, a like a middle schooler, maybe, or maybe even like a, a young high schooler, I remember running into one of my teachers in the grocery store and it was like, you eat food, you know, like, I, I really thought like, they just like, at the end of the day, the principal came around and plugged all the teachers in and charged them overnight. And we came back the next day and they unplugged them and turned them on. They started teaching. Like they're like teachers to me until a certain point in my life were like very two dimensional. And I think like, whether they like the music or not, I just think it's kind of interesting and cool that I give them an opportunity to see a, a, a three dimensional person you know what I mean or at least mm -hmm. uh, another facet to a teacher's life like I'm I'm a teacher and I do this you know so yeah cool man uh so next one I really like do you think collaboration with other genres would hurt credibility in bluegrass um yes do I <laughs> no I, um I think there's going to be a difference of opinion between what I think about this and what I think a lot of people like me as a musician and what I think about it and what I know of what little bit I know about the industry and, and the music business. Um, I think there's a difference between the way I see it and the way a lot of listeners would see it. Um, I think, I think collaboration is a great way 
as a musician to open yourself to other markets of people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think you would have to be careful and very selective, at least in the bluegrass world, about who you were deciding to collaborate with. Um, Just because, like I said, there, there are some folks who are super into the progressive stuff, but then you've got a lot of folks that are really, really, really purist too. Um, so I, I don't know how you, how you, I guess it would depend on which group of those, which, you know, which side of that you were, you were trying to appeal to. Um, but I mean, there have actually been some bands that have done some collaborative work with people outside of the bluegrass world. Um, and, and it's been, you know, pretty successful. Um, even, even like, uh, and I, just one off the top of my head, you know, Alan Jackson, the country singer, had a really good bluegrass album that came out a couple years ago. Dirks Bentley did the same thing, and the Punch Brothers were on his album. So, uh, you know, I think collaboration is a, a good way to like to, to continue to move things forward um, and not let it get stale. And like I said, as a as a musician, I have to recognize the fact that if I collaborate with somebody that people are already accessing on, on social media and already accessing on, you know, these, these other like streaming platforms and things like that, then it's a possibility of like cross pollination, you know, and, and that I, I personally, I just don't think that's ever a bad thing. So. Um, and then the last, uh, last one, uh, that was a good answer there. Um, where do you draw your inspiration for your songs? Um, <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Like I, I will say, like, I do, out of our three albums, I've probably written four four or five songs, maybe. I don't know. That's just an estimate. If I went back and looked, that might be way off. But um, I would say I write close to half of the material on any given album. Um, And I don't really have a method. I know that's weird, uh, maybe, but, like, I, I can go like weeks or even months and, and not write anything. Um, and then all of a sudden in like a two week period, I'll write like six or seven songs and not all of them will be album material. Half of them will get thrown away, you know, whatever. But um, I don't know how to turn the switch on and off. It just, it happens and then it goes away and then it comes back and then it goes away. I'm not really concerned about it ever going away and staying gone. I, I think it's something that's just part of me. I'll always, I'll, it'll always come out, you know? Um, but as far as that goes, like when it hits, I just know that I'd better, I'd better have a piece of paper and a pencil, you know, like I, I bet on this last album, half of those songs seriously originated on like a sticky note or a, or even like a, a little note in my cell phone because I didn't have paper. Like I wrote one of the songs that was on our latest album, Miss We Tell Our Young. I can verify that I wrote it on my cell phone while sitting in a tree stand. So it's just, you know, when it hits, you just got to go with it. Um, but man, I mean, it's just about life. You know, um, you, you have things that happen in your life that are happy. Uh, that make you make you want to smile, things that make you proud, things that are embarrassing, things you're ashamed of, things that you wish you could fix that you can't, things that, you know, um, like 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 I told you uh, earlier, like uh, we just we we have a little girl now, and 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 she is a huge source of emotional intensity for me, and figuring out how to harness that and put it into my music is something that. I mean, it's, sometimes it's a struggle because it's like some of the things you feel strong enough to write a song about, it's almost so overwhelming that you can't quite like articulate it. Um, it's, it's a messy process for me, but I mean, I, I just draw from life. Awesome, man. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on, dude. But before we let you go, why don't you let everybody know uh, where they can find your music and uh, website, uh, music yeah. videos, and all that stuff. Absolutely, sure. So, um, again, the name of the group is Unspoken Tradition. Um, you can find us on any platform that you download or stream music from, primarily iTunes and Spotify. Uh, we're on Amazon, too. Um, 
uh, our website is unspokentradition.com. We've got some videos up on YouTube and things like that. Um, we've got some social media. Anybody that's listening to this, I'd love for you to give us a follow. We actually, I, I actually try to create most of the content on our Instagram page, and I think I do a pretty good job of it. It's pretty interesting to me. Uh, so, but it's uh, Unspoken Tradition Bluegrass. Uh, we have a Facebook page. Um, anybody, anybody out there that's interested, give us a follow. We, we try to interact with anybody that would happen to comment or message us, you know, pretty, pretty regularly. So, uh, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to us. We're all, we're all nice guys and, you know, Hey, uh, check out our show dates. And if you're in, if we're in your area, come, come see us. Uh, for those of you who were asking about a definition of bluegrass, like no better way to figure that out than to come watch a show. Right. So that's my shameless self-promotion. There, there you go, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining. And uh, we'll, we'll, I'm going to try to have you back on again. We'll see how, we'll see where life takes you. And then we'll, we'll have you yeah, back man. on to update us, okay? That'd be good. Jack, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. You too, man. Have a great one. You too. All right, bye. This guy does not go to the bathroom outside of the house. He, he... I'm getting better. It has to be like a really special place for him to take.